George Lucas was worth fifty billion dollars. All right. So this today, I think the recorder is definitely on. Okay, the audio is on. Great. Okay. So are there any questions from you guys about the homework that is due next Tuesday? Yep. What's the void asterisk f pointer thing? All right. Well, let's get to it. What's I log in? Okay. Let's go to CISP310. Is it in a header file or? It's a function, it's a flat function with no.c. Oh, that one. That one is extra cool. Okay, so let me. Uh, save file is fine. All right, so the question was um, what is that? void and then in parentheses you have the asterisk and then the name and then outside you have another pair of asterisks with you know what seems to be the type of parameters right okay so let me explain that one um, it's not really particularly related to this class but it is um, something that you might actually encounter once in a while when you run when you uh, read programs in C it's called a um, okay let, let me get there first not documents, downloads. downloads. And the file name is for three. Dot tar. Huh? I thought you just downloaded for dot tar. What is the name of the uh, tar file? Tor. Oh, okay. Downloads the wrong one. Let's try okay. it here. And here's three dot tar dot gz. There we go. All right. <coughs> and it's, is it in no.c or the other one? No.c. No.c, okay. So let's see. So the question is, what is this thing? You are right. I forgot to explain this one. <laughs> <coughs> this is a pointer to a subroutine in C. Okay. So the way you use a pointer to a subroutine is um, on line 108. Okay. So on line 108, it is the quote unquote referencing the pointer to a subroutine, um, and we are passing the parameter PC to the subroutine. So this way, it let you specify as a parameter the address of a subroutine so that you know you don't have to specify exactly what we are doing with each child. We are just you know, basically using another subroutine to specify what we're doing with, the, with each child um, of this particular node. Okay? So since you know, this is a concept that is usually not included in the previous C class, I'm just going to give you the code to do this part. Okay? <clears throat> so today's uh, recording is also particularly useful. Okay, so we have a pound of zero, and if, you know, just so that it is going to be, you know, ignored by the compiler. Okay. So if you think about it, okay, let's see what, uh, okay, what is a pointer to a function? How, how is it represented on the stack? What, what do you think? Or bytes, exactly, because it is a pointer. So whether it is a pointer to void, a pointer to a pointer to a structure, or a pointer to a structure, or a pointer to a function, it is same, the same thing, four bytes, okay? Because everything is represented by a 32-bit address. So that means to uh, FTTR, or function pointer, is nothing more than just another pointer from the perspective of what it looks like on the stack. The only difference is how do you use it? Because it is not the address of an integer, it is not the address of a structure, it is not even the address of another pointer, it is an address of a function. Okay? What do we do with functions? We call functions, right? Okay, so let's figure out you know, how we can actually call a function where the address is passed on the stack. Okay? 
So assuming we have the same uh, uh, the same convention, you know, FPTR as a symbol is defining the offset to that particular entry on the call frame. So we'll make that assumption. So the first thing we want to do is to uh, do something like this. Um, well, maybe not. Okay, let, let me let me let me show you the code to, to do something like this. Um, well, I'll just specify a continuation point here. And let me scroll things up a little bit so we can see a little bit better. Okay, so the first thing you would actually do well, when you're about to do it. Okay. okay, regardless of you know whether we are calling a subroutine normally or we are calling a subroutine that is pointed to by a pointer, you still have to push the parameters. And the way you push parameters is no different this time compared to all of the other cases where you have to push parameters. So in this case, we have to push these PC on the stack. And PC is a local variable. So that means you know, if I have you know, the uh, labels defined properly, this will push the parameter, right? There's only one. So once you push the parameter, what is the next thing that a call is supposed to push? It's supposed to call, push the return address. There are two ways to do this now. Okay, the first way, I'm not really, well, I suppose I can, I can test it later. The first way is to do the call using explicit instructions. Do you still remember how to do that? So let me show you a few lines. Okay, this is really a good way to prepare for the exam because I'm going to use the instructions that we all know already, but I'm going to implement something that is you know, doing this kind of thing here. Okay. So the first thing I'm going to push is the return address itself, which is the label cont. Okay, continuation point is it is an address, and it is basically just a continuation point where you know I would deallocate the stack and do all kinds of other stuff. Okay, so at the continuation point, you know, typically we just uh, add four in this case to the stack corner to reclaim the space that was previously used up by the parameter. <clears throat> okay, now at this point, at, on line 113, we want to continue execution, but not at a particular label. We want to continue execution um, where FPTR is pointing to. Okay, so how do we do it? There are at least two ways to do it. I, I'll just go ahead and first describe one way that we should know already of how to do it. Jump. So a jump would not work entirely. Um, you, you have to load the address into a register first before you, you uh, do the jump with an asterisk, right? So that way we'll, it, will, it will work that way. So let me just describe what it is. This is the first way to do it. So move um, FPTR EBP into a register. I'm going to pick EAX here. And then you do a jump with an asterisk before percent %EAX. So that will work, okay? Because remember, this is something that we talked about um, when we talked about a return instruction. Remember, kind of, okay? So this will work, but there's another way to do it. So are we are we okay with this one? Okay. So the other way to do this is like this: you push EAX on the stack, which is actually kind of redundant because I could have just pushed this one on the stack. <coughs> So what I'm doing is I'm pushing the address of the subroutine or where I'm supposed to go on the stack. Well, a whole lot of good that's gonna do me, right? What if the next instruction is a return? So think about what we are doing here on the stack, okay? Now this is a really good test, okay, of how well you understand the instructions, okay? This is indirect call, but using only the you know, instructions that we already know. Uh, line 111 is not a part of it. Line 11 and also line 116 are really just for the parameters. And there's no change whatsoever to the way we push and you know, reclaim the space on parameters. So that part, there's no change. But from line 112 to line 115 is what we call a indirect call. In other words, the place for the subroutine that we are calling is not a fixed label. It is passed to me as a pointer, as a four byte thing. So when you look at the code, what I'm doing here is on line, line 12, 
I am pushing the return address, which is necessary because you, because the server team needs to know where do I go back to. That is pushing the return address, which is usually done as a part of the call instruction. Once we push the return address, the next thing we have to do is to say, okay, now we have to continue execution at that particular address, which is not a fixed place, it is passed to me as a pointer. So in this case, what I do is I push FPTR EDP, which is the parameter, the, which is the parameter itself on the stack. Well, that really doesn't change you know, the direction of where I'm going. Well, but what if I execute a return right away? What does return do? Return treats whatever the stack pointer points to as a return address. Well, what did I just push? Where, where I'm supposed to go, right? So that will accomplish the uh, incomplete, the indirect call in assembly. And I think you can just kind of, except for you know the, this is making the assumption that you have PC and FPTR defined as the displacement of those particular items from where EDP, or where EDP points to, which is kind of the uh, convention that we use in this class at this point. So assuming those labels are defined properly, this code will work. But thanks for asking the question. I, I kind of forgot about this one. <laughs> there, there are holes in my mind, but not in the sense that I do not know what I'm doing, but in the sense of I do not know, you know, uh, what you guys learned in CISD 360. This is a kind of, um, this is something that is basically deprecated by C++. Because with C++, you know, the object-oriented programming language, what people would do is they would actually define you know, classes around you know, functions, so that you know, instead of passing the address of a function, you just create an object and you pass the object to uh, do the same thing. So it's kind of a thing that is you know, useful, but only in C, but not in C++. That was a good question. So you just kind of missed out. <laughs> Right. Any other questions? That was a really good one. Any other questions? No other questions. Okay. So all I can say is, you know, this one will take time as well. The challenge of this particular homework assignment is not quite the same as the previous one. The previous one has a lot of, you know, push pop, you know, map map copy and stuff like that. This one is mostly really about, you know, do you know how to get to members of a structure that is pointed to by a pointer, where that pointer itself is pointed to by a parameter. Okay, that happens a little bit with this particular program. All right, well, just to be sure, let me, <coughs> let me go from the beginning, you know, just to make sure that we understand, you know, each and every subroutine, you know, all the constructs. Are there any questions about node init from line five to line nine? I think that one is fairly standard, okay? Um, the first thing is, you know, we are now passing pointers to structures. We are no longer passing entire structures on the stack, okay? So you gotta make sure that you remember that we are no longer passing structures by value. We are using only pointers in this case. Uh, the second thing is, you know, I think most people know it already, but I just want to emphasize it. There is no function called size of, okay? Size of is actually called an operator in C and C++, it is not called a function. So it is really just represented by, in this case, your struct node underscore size. That's basically what it is. <coughs> okay. Assuming there are no questions from line five to line nine, we're gonna move on to line 11 to line 16. So from line 11 to line 16, I think last time I kind of pointed out already, line 13 and line 14, even though the syntax seems to be quite a bit different, they are really doing the same thing. In other words, me is a pointer to a structure, and we are accessing the, you know, the two different members, what and where, as members of the structure pointed to by me. The syntax is different. The first one on line 13 is unconventional. Okay, you know, I will be somewhat, I will be somewhat surprised you know, that your CISP 360 class used that notation. But that's basically what it is, okay? The other notation that looks like a pointer or an arrow is basically a shorthand of you know, dereferencing first and then accessing the memory. Are there any questions about line 13 and line 14? No 
questions? This is all good so far? Okay. So now we are moving on to the next subroutine, which is the append subroutine. The append subroutine is recursive. Um, and we, I actually talked about line 22, or something like line 22 on Tuesday. So the recording on Tuesday, even though it is silent because the audio is not there, um, the code that goes along with it is already in this file. Okay, I tar off, uh, I tar up you know, the file, all the files at the end of the class. So everything that I did on Tuesday is actually in the tar log itself. So you are you, you actually have access to a snippet of code to implement that. Um, I also drew a picture. Okay, so I does I start to draw the picture again. So what happened? Here, what happened here? Look, this is out of ink. In a way, you know, a chalkboard is better sometimes because there's no way a piece of chalk will run out of chalk, and I cannot tell that it's running out of chalk. With these things, it's hard to say. Okay, so PE is a pointer, but it's not just a pointer, it is a pointer to a pointer. So these four bytes is the address of some four bytes somewhere else. <laughs> Where are these four bytes? Well, do we care? We don't need to know, okay? It could be somewhere on the stack, it could be a global variable, it could be in a heap. It doesn't really matter. What really matters is these four bytes is an address as well. But these four bytes is not an address of another four bytes, it is the address of structure. Okay, this is a struct node. Is that okay so far? So when you look at the syntax, you know, what we're doing um, after the D reference and then the point to, we are now at this point here. We want to access P next to sibling as a memory. I don't really know where it is, okay, because there should be a label defining the distance from uh, the beginning of the entire structure to the first byte of P next to sibling. Okay, so assuming that one is already done, but this time you have to be careful because we have an ampersand in front of the entire thing. So if you look at how the parentheses are nesting, this is considered one entire thing. And I'm trying to take the address of the member itself. In other words, I am not interested in these four bytes. I'm interested in the address of these four bytes. Okay. Well, if I already have the address to the base of the entire structure, how do I get to the address of a particular member in the structure? Well, I'm going to just for <coughs> we just add the displacement amount, right? So we just have to be careful, you know, that in this case we are looking for the address of the member, not the member itself. Okay. Um. Anything else? Any other questions about um, uh, node append? It's calling itself, you know, is that bothering anyone? Okay, it's not bothering anyone, that's good. Um, the rest of the code, you know, should be okay too. You just have to, you just have to be careful, you know, when we are referring to PME all by itself, and when we are dereferencing it at least once before you, we make use of the value. Okay. Are there any questions? No questions? Okay. Um, why do we have to pass the pointer to a pointer to a structure in this case? Which line gives you an idea of, oh, okay, there's no other way to do this unless we do it in C++? Oh, it's one seven. Line 27 is the answer, that is correct, okay? Because the objective of line 27 is not to change the parameter. Changing the parameter is kind of pointless because the parameter is deallocated at the end of the invocation. So I'm not changing the parameter PB, I'm changing what it points to. In other words, I am trying to implement pass by reference, but only using pointers. Well, if there's such a thing called passing by reference, why are you using pointers to do it? Because in C, there is no passing by reference. Is that okay so far? Okay, so for those of you who have learned you know, what is passing by reference, 
Um, this is kind of like passing by reference, but we are using a low-level mechanism to do that. <coughs> well, if there's a way to do passing by reference, why do we have to learn you know, all kinds of stuff about pointers? They're useful in certain situations, but why is it useful in certain situations? Because for the most part, you know, C++ is a superset of C, which means most people would move on to C++ and not have to worry about archaic features like you know, using a pointer so that you can implement your know, passing by reference. So you still use pointers in C++. Hmm? So you still use pointers in C++. You can still use pointers in C++, but most people want to limit the use of pointers in C++ only to point to another structure so you can form link lists. Yeah. And they don't use it for the purpose of passing by reference. No, they don't. Okay, can anyone imagine the source code collection of Linux, the operating system? Do you think it's written in C or C++? C. It's written in plain C. Well, there you go. So if your job somehow involves the maintenance of some utility program where it is completely written in C, passing by reference is not an option. You cannot easily change a project that is mostly written in plain C into C++. Your boss is not going to like it. <coughs> All right? So there is a need to understand how to do this in regular C. Yep? Passing by reference is still passing by address. It is still passing by address, but you don't have you don't need the the explicit uh, dereference, which can lead to problems. And there's no way you can pass a wrong address when you are passing by reference, because the compiler makes sure that the caller is using a uh, variable or something that actually has a valid address to pass as the to pass the address. Whereas you know if you pass by pointer, uh, someone can pass a null pointer. The compiler has no idea that passing a null pointer is the wrong thing to do. So that's the that's the main difference. You know, that is why you know if you can pass by reference, you should not be using this mechanism. All right. So if there are no questions about this, we are going to move on to add child. Add child has you know that kind of same thing again, but this time you know p uh, me is not a pointer to a pointer. Me is just a pointer. So you do not want to copy and paste code you know, without actually looking at the code that you're dealing with. Because the other one, I think, is, is a PME. Yep. See this one is a PME. OK, let me, let me see if I can display both lines at the same time. Uh, that's good. So when you look at this line here, or when you look at this parameter, as opposed to this parameter, they look almost exactly the same with only one minor difference that actually is, makes a big difference. In this case, it is using a pointer th thing, which means there's one, lev one more level of the reference, and then this one has a dot here. So you gotta make sure that you differentiate between these two cases. One is a pointer to a pointer, the other one is just a pointer, okay? Because otherwise, if you look at these two things, they look almost the same, you just copy and paste code, that is not gonna work. All right, notes delete. So with note delete, you know, this is the code that I was talking about earlier. Um, this is the actual code to implement uh, pushing uh, this particular parameter, or making the entire call, actually. You know, this is making the entire call without the code to clean up the stack. I'm still, I did not put in the, the, code to, uh, the code to clean up the stack. Are there any questions about this one? Um, <laughs> that is a that's a good question. Well, I suppose you know the the program will break you know when we count up to uh, two billion something. <laughs> but good point, you know, definitely you know, good point. Any other questions? Any other questions? Okay, moving on. Any other questions? Well, no delete is also recursive, in case you haven't noticed. Well, would recursion be any more difficult than a normal function call? No. 
What about from the debugging perspective? Okay, now that we know that you know, there are at least two functions that are recursive, how would you write the program and how would you test your program? I'm going to write the entire, I will write all the subroutines in assembly without testing anything, and I will go ahead and test it all 500 lines of assembly code all at the same time. I will just cross all my fingers and hope for the best. Who would do that? Well, an approach like that means you know you might get the program done <coughs> at the end of the summer. Mm -hmm. Okay, so how would you approach problem? How would you start get started with this project? One function at a time. <coughs> at a time and would you pick uh, no delete first as a first uh, subroutine to implement? Yes. That would be kind of difficult. Okay, I would pick some, I would pick something that is that's a lot easier. I would pick something that is already done, like node get where. <laughs> okay, but I would not just uh, I would not just do it. I would look at this code and I would you know, annotate this code with comments of my own, just to make sure that I understand you know, how this code is working. Then I'm going to move on to get where because it is about the same as get. Uh, excuse me, get what, okay, which is the one before that, so that, you know, I will get, and then I will, every single time I implement something, <clears throat> I would test it, okay, in, in other words, I'm going to retest the code every single time I implement something. Um, one thing that you want to differentiate is, you know, what is, what test cases you would, you would want to use. Uh, for these, it doesn't really matter which one you use, because it, this, it's not recursive in nature, um, has offspring is the other one that you can implement. Uh, we <coughs> talked about this one on Tuesday. Uh, it looks kind of awkward that we are comparing a pointer to a null value um, and then return either a one or a non zero or a zero okay, at the end. Um, so if you kind of know what, what I was talking about on Tuesday, uh, the implementation of this particular subroutine is actually very easy. Okay, it's actually as easy as the other subroutines that we have talked about. Um, what about something like, I would not worry about delete, okay? I would implement delete all the way at the end. There's no need to worry about that one yet. Um, node add child, you know, would be the next one that I would implement. Um, the difficulty of this particular subroutine is on line 34, which has that little complicated thing that is going on, okay? But I would do this one as the next one because once you've mastered this one, the other ones would not be too difficult. Okay, then we are moving on to, um, well, we can, we can move on to set value and init. Okay, those two are fairly easy too. So when it is time to move on to node append, which is kind of complex because it is recursive, okay? What you want to do is you do not want to go for a, you know, the most general test case. What you want to do is to do, go for the simple ones first. Okay. In other words, don't create a list. Just have one single node. Type an integer, and the program should print the integer back. Um, input a string, you know, that only has a to z, and the program should echo back the entire string. So I would go that route first. Okay. Because if if it works for a single node without a linked list, that means the part that is not doing the recursion is working. Now it's good to know that the part that is not doing the recursion is working first before you start to work on the part that is recursive. Is that okay? In other words, when you supply only an integer, uh, the, recurs the recursive code, which is line 22, is not going to get triggered. So that means you know, the only part that, will ex that you are exercising will be line 26 and line 27 when that works, then you would want to want to use. The, then you can use a more complicated test case where you actually have a list. Are we doing okay so far with those concepts? You know how to gradually test your program by increasing the complexity of the test cases. Is that okay? So even though it looks kind of complicated, you know, for this particular homework assignment. Many of the subroutines have similarities, which means if once you get one done, you know the other ones would be 
not too difficult to deal with. Okay. All right. So I really don't have anything else to add to the homework assignment other than get started early. <laughs> Maybe due on Thursday. It is due on Thursday. Oh, it's due Tuesday. On it's due oh, on Tuesday. Thursday. <laughs> Everything else I have in the whole world is on Tuesday. <laughs> Uh, well, that's the that's the bad news part of what I refer to on Tuesday. Yeah. Mm. Any other questions about this? No questions. This is all okay so far. Okay. I still have office hours on to, uh, tomorrow, on Friday, and also on Monday, and also on Tuesday. So if you run into anything that you cannot explain, or you know, you ju you're just kind of stuck you know, with either the tools or the make file or anything like that, you know, just come see me during my office hour, and you know, we can try to get most of the roadblocks you know, cleared um, during the office hours. Right. So, assuming there are no questions, if you have any questions, you know, you just say, "Oh, I just remembered, you know, there's one question. Let me know." But you know, for the time being, I'm going to move forward to um, the next big topic. Yes, there's one more big topic that we have to go over, which is uh, I/O and interrupts. And I have not brought in the uh, the necessary links yet. All right. Go home. Hmm? Sorry? Go home. Yes, go. Oh, no. I, I, I can teach this class without Moodle, without the network. <laughs> um, OK, so. let's go talk about your input, output, and interrupts, and how do we ask the operating system to do something? Because at this point, none of your programs is printing anything. The only type of printing that you're doing is by, by calling printf. Okay. So without calling printf, how do you write a program that performs input and output? Well, you don't have the mechanism to do it just yet. Okay? So I'm going to show you a program that prints something to the screen but without using printf. This is a self-contained uh, program that is completely 100% written in assembly. So this will show you the low level mechanism of actually you know, how to perform file output and also later on file input. So let me write the program first, and then we'll go ahead and explain what it is, or how it get how it gets it done. So make your IO. Um, we'll call this hello hello dot s. Lowercase s is fine. It's it's a pure assembly language program. So we have the usual dot global underscore start underscore start. Before this, we can specify a string. So we can say str.ascii. Not doesn't have a z at the end. Okay, I do not need a no terminated string in this case. And then we can just say you know hello, hello world. There we go. And I'm going to specify end string here as a label. And this is the entire program. Push l dollar four dot e dot e. Push L, no, nope, move L, sorry, excuse me. Move L dollar four into EAX, move L dollar one into EBX, move L um, dollar STR into ECX, and the last one is move dollar um, ST string N minus string into EDX. And this is the mysterious part. Int dollar uh, x zero, zero x zero, eight zero. Okay, we have seen this instruction before, yes. but not in this particular context. And then I would do the usual exit code, which is, hey, it's almost the same kind of thing, except I'm moving different stuff into different spots. All right, this is the entire program. Um, I will assemble and link the program and then run it first and then we'll come back and explain what is going on with this program. So we'll go ahead and do ASG staff dash o hello dot o hello dot s ld dash o hello hello dot o and then just run it. 
and then prints hello world you know I didn't specify an end of line character at the end and that's why you know it doesn't open up a new line when the program is all done so but it did print hello world you know to the outside world so let me go back to the program and this time we'll take a closer look at the program and try to figure out what it's actually doing there we go all right <clears throat> Are there any questions about line 6 all the way up to line 9? Fairly standard stuff, you know, the first operand is an immediate operand, and the second operand or is one of the registers, E, A, X, E, C, X, E, C, X, and E, X. How does that do anything like printing something on the screen? Well, the magic has got to be which line? Line 12, okay? And then the other three lines, you know, line, 25, line 15 and line 16, again, you know, just, just moving something into two registers. Um, so the magic of exiting the program properly is on line 17. But you can see that line 12 and line 17 are exactly the same. So how can this instruction sometimes you know, do something that is printing something to the standard output file, and other times it's exiting a program entirely? EAX and EBX value? EAX in particular, okay? EAX in particular is basically a flag, not a flag, because a flag implies it's either a zero or a one, it's an indicator, okay? It is basically saying, if it is a one, it means I want to exit the program. If it's four, I want to do an output, if it's three, I want to do a file input, and so on. Okay? So <coughs> it is kind of like a call, but it's not a call. So that means, you know, we kind of have, and the, the full name of int is what? Can, does anyone remember what it is? Instruction. Not instruction. Instruction is INS. <laughs> interrupt. Okay, very good. Someone said interrupt. Okay. Why do you think it's interrupt? Okay, I think I explained this one once before, you know, about, you know, the file, uh, not file, but just general input output, interrupts. You yes. remember, you know, I'm sleeping, dozing off in my office, yep. and you guys are knocking on the door as an interrupt, okay? So why, okay, so with, with a system where you want to have multiple people, you know, using the system, and it has, it's running in protective mode, which means, a normal user cannot trash the operating system, okay? So in a situation like that, would a normal process be able to access the input-output devices? No. Because if that is the case, if an end-user process can access input-output devices, then anyone can send a request and say, oh, you know what, I want to change, you know, sector 2016 and, you know, uh, 2016 to uh, all ones. And if that operation actually does go through to the SATA controller, then nothing is safe, right? That would not be a good situation. So that means you have to lock out certain instructions from a normal end user process. And therefore, we are now creating two levels of privileges in the, in the entire operating system. The kernel, the drivers, and whatnot, they run at a higher or elevated privilege level and end user processes will run at a lower privilege level. And we do okay so far with that concept. All right, what happens when an interrupt happens? What happens when your SATA controller says, okay, all the bytes that you asked me to transfer onto the hard drive is all done. Do you have anything else for me to do? Well, that is, that's a valid reason to have an interrupt, okay? Because you might have a whole lot more to transfer and you don't want to you know, do polling and keep asking the SATA controller are you done yet? Are you done yet? Are you done yet? Are you done yet? Okay, you want to basically say, okay, this is what you need to do. Go do it. Let me know when you're done. Well, that let me know when you're done is setting up the SATA controller to interrupt the operating system to when it is all done. Is that okay so far? So at some point of time, the SATA controller will get you know everything done and you know, it, it will raise an interrupt to the operating system and basically say, okay, what you asked me to do is already done. Is there anything else to do? Okay. Well, in that case, what if you know, a, an end user process is running at a time? Well, if an end user process is running at a time, 
then the privilege level is really low. And the ISR, or the interrupt surface routine, the logic that actually deals with the interrupt, would not be able to read or write or do any type of low-level low access to the SATA controller. So we have a problem. The only solution to the problem is in hardware, when an interrupt happens, the system will automatically elevate the privilege level to the high level. So that when you execute the ISR, when the operating system run the interrupt surface routine, the ISR is always run at what? The high or the low privilege level. It has to be the high privilege level because the ISR needs to you know, tell the SATA controller and say, okay, uh, I don't have anything else for you to do. You don't have to interrupt me anymore. Or, you know, there's more stuff for you to do. This is what needs to be done. So the ISR has to run at a high privilege level. So by having an interrupt, the processor has the necessary hardware to actually change the privilege level. Is that okay so far? What happens at the end of the execution of the ISR? In other words, when the, when the operating system is done telling the SATA controller, okay, this is the next block of data that I want you to write to that sector. The ISR is, done, is all done. So the ISR is now ready to return control back to the user process that was interrupted to begin with. What should happen in that return process? What about the privilege level? I'm still at a higher or elevated privilege level, but I'm going back to a process that is not supposed to have the high privilege level. So what needs to happen? It needs to go down. It needs to go back to where it was when the interrupt happens. And guess what? That is also done automatically. So the return, so the, the so-called return instruction is specialized you know, for interrupt subroutines. It will automatically return the privilege level to where it was before. Is that okay? So that means the, the processor, when it handles an interrupt, it has the necessary hardware, the circuitry, to automatically elevate the privilege level when it's all done, when we execute the return instruction, or return from interrupt instruction, R-E-T-I instruction, it will also know how to restore the original privilege level. Okay, so that does not seem to have anything to do with printing something to the screen. Okay, so, so now that we have you know, talked about you know, the ISR, interrupt service routine, elevating and returning to a normal privilege level, Let's think about the role of an operating system. What is the role of an operating system? What, what is it supposed to do? You can think about you know, what happens without an operating system. And then you know, oh, okay, I guess you know, it's doing all of these things. Yeah, nothing happens without an operating system. Hmm? Not much is going to happen without an operating system. Not much can happen without an operating system. Well, that's kind of true, you know, but it's... Even if you, like, boot from back in the day, boot from floppy disk, get a, some kind of something to control what's happening. Just think okay. controls processes access to system resources. Okay, so you're, you're definitely getting to the correct, you know, interpretation or, you know, describing you know, what an operating system is. An operating system is really a resource manager, okay? About everything else, it is a resource manager. In other words, if you need to display something, you know, if you need to send something to a file, you're not, your process, your own program, is not going to access the SATA controller to do everything, right? Because if you were to do something like that, then your program has to understand how a file system operates, right? You know, how do you write to a certain sector in order to append to the end of a file? What about memory? Your program occasionally will need more memory, right? Okay, if you're using the heap, you know, sometimes you need to you have to have access to more memory. So why don't I just grab, you know, another chunk of memory from uh, the main system and start using it? What would be a problem with that approach? You don't know what memory is being used by other processes. Exactly. There are other processes, you know, that belong to other people are running it. So it's just think about the power server, right? If there's, no, if there's nothing to manage the resources and everybody just grab whatever seems to be available, what would happen in that case? Chaos. Chaos, right? Nobody actually gets any work done. Anarchy. 
Anarchy, exactly. So what is preventing anarchy to happen in real life? Operating system. Okay. No, 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 in real life, you like, you know, physically here. The law, okay, the law is good, okay? But the law is nothing more than what we call social, IFC. Social agreements. Social agreements, well, we can agree all we want, but some people can say, well, I lied. Police, <laughs> police. but the police belongs to a certain organization. The government, right? An operating system is the government. So when you want to do something, you gotta get a permit. <laughs> you have to, okay, I wanna do something like this, I'm requesting, please, let me do something like this. If the request is okay, then the operating system will come back and say, okay, fine, you can do it. Um, if the request is not okay, then the operating system will come back and say, sorry, I cannot let you do it. Is that making any sense? Okay. Um, so when you think about the role of an operating system, do you think the operating system needs to have elevated uh, privilege level when it's doing what it needs to do? Yeah, it certainly needs to do that, right? So the next question now is, you are an end user process. What is a file operation? What is a file, by the way? That seems to be a pretty simple question. What is a file? Collection of data. Okay. Well, okay, let, let me kind of go through the most common understanding of what a file is. Okay, what, 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 what most people think of what a file is. Uh, it has a file name, it lives somewhere on the hard drive or on the flash disk, right? Uh, you can do certain things to a file, you can create it, you can move it around, you can delete it. Um, it is persistent, okay? So when you turn off your computer, what you have already saved on the hard drive will remain to be there, okay? So all of these things are what most people think when they think of a file. But in a programming class like this one, a file is nothing more than a stream of bytes, okay? Think of it as a conveyor belt. An input file is a conveyor belt coming into your process. And an output file is a conveyor belt going out of your process. That's it. Okay, so that means you know, with an output file, all you are doing is you're placing items on an outgoing conveyor belt. You're saying, okay, here's one byte, send it out. Here's another byte, send it out. Here's another byte, send it out. Where, it, where are you sending those bytes to? Who knows? You have no control over the other end of the conveyor belt. You can also say, okay, I want to process something. I'm gonna look at the, the conveyor belt that is coming into a process. So you grab a byte, you process it, you grab another byte, you process it, and so on. But do you know who is sending you those bytes? Nope, you have no control nor the knowledge of who is on the other end of the conveyor belt. So those two files are the basic principle you know, files to every process in, I would say, in Linux, in Unix, and possibly in Windows as well, okay? Because Windows down, with, down under is actually a fairly modern you know, design. In your C and C++ class, CISP 360, how do we call those particular files? Those two files that we, I was just talking about. You know it as C in and C out, okay? But C in and C out are nothing more than the names of the objects representing a particular concept. What are the cons What is the name of those concepts? <coughs> Go ahead. Again? Input stream, output stream. But in this particular case, they map to certain, there's a name for those two files. Standard. Standard input, standard output. Exactly, standard input file and standard output file. Every process actually has four files pre-open. Standard in, standard out. Okay, those are the two ones that we are all familiar with. There's also standard er, okay which in C++ is represented by C-E-R-R, C -E -R -R, okay? And there's also a, 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 a fourth file that is always available. It's called an aux, auxiliary. It is also an output file, but most people do not use it. Okay, do okay so far so, you know, in terms of the concept of a file. It's just a stream. An input file is a stream coming into the process. An output file is a stream that is going out of a process. Is that okay? 
Let's go to this particular program now. Now that we kind of understand, you know, the two concepts that are kind of that do not seem to be related, let's look at these this particular program and look at line six. Line six is putting a four, a value of four, which seems to be somewhat arbitrary into EAX. But what four really means to the operating system is file output. It's the right operation. So this specifies right. Okay. This one is controlling specifies standard output file. The four of the four files that are always available to a program, they're all enumerated in to zero, which is standard input, one is standard output, two is standard error, and three is standard auxiliary. And those four files are always available to every process, even to GUI programs. Are we doing okay so far with this concept? In other words, what you can what you can uh, visualize, how you can visualize this, is if you have a process, okay, every process has these four conveyor belts. You have one conveyor belt coming in, it is number zero, otherwise known as standard input. You have four, you have, excuse me, three outgoing conveyor belts. The most well-known conveyor belt is um, number one, it is standard out or standard output. Another one that is going out is Number two, it is standard error. And the third one, which is seldom used, is standard aux. This is number three. And this picture applies to every program. Even if you say, I don't need an input file, it's here. Even if you say, I don't need an output file, it's here as well. The only question is, are you doing anything with the conveyor belts? They are always there. Are there, are there any questions about this picture? Okay. <clears throat> so that's why we specify a one here, because we want to send this particular output to standard output file. What about this one? Just from the, uh, the first operand, I think this gives you an idea of what we are trying to specify here. This is a file write operation. We are trying to quote unquote print hello world, which is equivalent to sending those particular characters to standard output. So what is uh, what is STR as a label? Yes. The, address. the address of first byte. the first byte that we're trying to transmit. Okay, that's exactly what it is. Okay, this is the address of the first byte to transmit, which is basically saying you know, it is the first byte to put onto the conveyor belt. Okay. What about the last one? What about EDX? What do you think is stored in EDX? It is the difference between two labels. In other words, it is the difference between two addresses. What is significant about these two labels or the difference thereof? The, the length, exactly. The number of bytes between the two labels, right? So that's, that's the actual length or the number of bytes that we are attempting to transmit. So this is basically the number of bytes to transmit. What about this instruction now? How would I label this line? It's an interrupt, but isn't interrupt supposed to be hardware-based, like a SATA controller would cause an interrupt? Um, maybe your USB controller would cause an interrupt? This is called a software interrupt. In other words, instead of waiting for some hardware component to raise an interrupt, I am using a software instruction and say, hey, go through the whole motion of handling interrupt now, okay? And the purpose of doing this is to catch the attention of the operating system. And by doing so, it is not just like a regular call, because remember, when the computer, when, when your processor handles an interrupt, it will automatically raise the privilege level. This instruction will do exactly the same thing. Because it is, a, it, it, it is an interrupt, it's just you know, triggered by software intentionally. So it will raise the privilege level, go to the ISR, the ISR will then inspect the content of the registers. The first one it inspects is which one? Yeah. Which one do you think makes the difference? Yeah. Yeah. EAX, right? Okay, so the first one it will look at is EAX, and it will look, go through a whole table and say, 
okay, EAX is a four. Okay, I think the request is about to write into a file. Then it will know how to interpret the other registers. Because once it understands this is the right operation, then it understands EBX specifies which file to write to, ECX specifies the location of the first byte, and EDX specifies the number of bytes. Are we doing okay so far with that concept? In other words, this is basically saying, OS, please do it. That's what it's saying. It's requesting the operating system to do something. And what it is requesting is based on register EAX. The other registers are more like parameters than anything else. They're just applying additional information to complete the operation. What happens after the operation is all done? What, what happens after the OS says, okay, fine, you know, you want to send those bytes to standard output, get it done, and then come back to you. It will go through the same mechanism as coming back from an interrupt, right? And what, what is the, the special thing that happens when you come back from an interrupt service routine? What happens to the privilege level? It returns back to where it used to be, right? And it will do the same thing here. In other words, by the time you have control uh, on line 15 in this particular program, your process is not going to get the same uh, higher or elevated privilege level as the operating system because of the mechanism of returning from an interrupt. So this is a really, really nifty mechanism to make sure that you, you can make requests all you want, okay? But whether the operating system wants to do it or not is up to the operating system. And you do not gain, you know, uh, uh, elevated privilege level in the process either. Are we getting all of these concepts you know, together? The, yep, go ahead. So what's the purpose of the hexadecimal being zero after Because there are multiple software interrupts that you can that you can trigger. This is the one that the Linux operating system has decided to use as the single entry point to the entire operating system. In other words, you know, if you if you look at Linux, the operating system as an entire government, there's only one window, there's only one service window. <laughs> and that's called, you know, int uh, 83. Which is which is nice because now you know hacking the operating system is easy to defend because there's only one entry point. There's one place you can file your request. Yep. For Mac OS and Windows, do they only have one as well, or do they have multiple? I believe they have a similar architecture you know, because this is a, this is common to all the modern operating systems. Okay. Um, Windows NT is actually more modern than most people know it is or think it is. Um, most people think of Windows NT as an extension of Windows 3.1, which is DOS and stuff like that. That is actually not true. Uh, Windows NT is based on a joint project between IBM and Microsoft. Uh, IBM walked away with OS2, which eventually died in a horrible death. <laughs> um, and then Microsoft walked away with Windows NT. But, the, but N Windows NT is probably can be considered more modern in its design than Linux or BSD. Well, it's, yeah, NT stands for not there or the next technology, new technology, depending on where you, how you look at it. So, not to sidetrack us too much, but uh, yep. can you give an example of a couple of commonly used interrupt codes? Absolutely. Kind of what they do? Absolutely. I, I forgot to bring in the link from my, you know, from the other class, and that's why it's all missing here. So, let me try to bring that in first, or you can do a Google search. So, let's do a Google search. Um, mm -hmm. Linux. And eight zero um, numbers that would do it. Call table. There we go. Yep, there we go. So here we have a. <coughs> I'm going to bring those links in, you know. But you know, since I forgot to do it, I'm just going to use Google to go for it. This is a full table. Okay. So when you look at this, it even uses the AT and notation when EAX has a percent symbol before that, because you know this is written so that people can you know, deal with operating system calls in assembly. That is the whole intention of this table. So what this table is now saying is, okay, let me magnify it just a little bit, because the first part is more important than the rest. When EAX is one, the name of this thing is system exit. In other words, it is the same thing as calling exit in a C, C++ program. In other words, 
exit is not really a normal function call. It is a system function call. You're asking the operating system to terminate this particular process. That's what you're asking. Uh, number two is called fork, which is eh, a little bit interesting because <clears throat> this is actually how, in a Linux system, how you start off with one single process with the system boots, and you end up with a whole gazillion processes. Every time you run something from bash or the command line, it is quote unquote forking a new process. This is how a new process is created. The name fork comes from the point of comes from the fact that when you call this thing, um, it's 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 a little bit hard to explain. What happens when you call the, the call fork is it will duplicate the process itself up to the point of the call, but when it returns, it will return differently. Okay. To the parent, the one process, the originating process, it will return a particular value. I cannot remember. I think that the, okay, this is what it is. To the parent process, the one who is the first one, the one that is trying to uh, create the other process, it will return the process ID of the one that is created, a non-zero value. To the process, to the child process, the one that is actually created, it will return a value of zero. So now, you know, after the fork, the process itself knows whether I am the originating process or I am the you know, new process. Now, if you are the originating process, there might be other things that you need to do, so you just go ahead and continue to do whatever else you need to do. With the child process, okay, in the case of Bash, which is the command line interface program, um, then it will look through the command line itself and say, okay, I'm the new process, what am I supposed to do? Oh, the command line specifies this is the executable that you're supposed to run. And there's another program, there's another system called, called exec, which is probably down there um, uh, 11. That one will basically change the process and say, instead of running bash, you should be running this executable. That is how it switches to the new pro, that's how you start to run a new program is a two-step process. The first one is for to start a new process. The second one is to replace the original process, the, the original program, with a new program. It's called exec, E-C-E-C, E-X-E-C. -E -E Number three is really useful. It is just for reading. It looks almost exactly the same as write, except instead of specifying where you are writing from, you are now just specifying where you're reading to. Otherwise, it's almost identical. Because you, you still have to specify which file you're dealing with and um, how many bytes you're requesting to read in this case. Uh, write, we just you know, talked about this one. Open allows you to open a particular file. In other words, what if your program does not want to read from the standard input file, but instead a specific file? Use open, okay? So you use open to specify a string that specifies the actual path of the file that you want to open. And if, you, if the open operation is successful, it will return an integer. But it is guaranteed that this integer is not 0, 1, 2, or 3, because those four numbers are used up by the default conveyor belts already. But it will return just an integer value to represent a file that is now properly opened. Uh, close is just the other way around. Okay, you're done with the file, you can close it. So the file can now be accessed by other processes. So there's a whole bunch of you know, other stuff like this. Um, I can only talk about certain types here because uh, some of these are really um, way off topic for us. Uh, seek is, allows you to go to a particular position in a file. So if you have a binary file and you want to go to a particular location to either read or write, LSeq allows you to switch to that location. Get key ID you know, is get process ID so that you know what is your own process ID. Um, so a lot of these are, you know, some of these are kind of easy to understand. Some of these are not so easy to understand. Kill is a misnomer. Because kill seems to suggest that we are terminating either the process itself or some other process. That is actually not true, okay? Kill is more like send signal. Should be replaced by the name send signal. 
and one, two of the signals are related to termination of the process, but the other ones are not terminate, termination the signals. It's a way for processes to talk to each other. So this is a complete misnomer because you know, <laughs> it suggests you know, killing, but it's actually talking. It's all like just you know, telling the other process something. Sorry, go ahead. It's kind of a random name. Um, I think the original you know, signal was to kill a process, and you know, the name just got stuck. <clears throat> and then we have the usual stuff, rename, make directory, remove directory. Dupe is um, making two file handles out of one, okay, it's duplicating a file handle. Uh, pipe is kind of like dupe, except um, one becomes the input and the other one becomes the output. So these, so the, it will basically create two file handles or two integers. One integer can serve as the output. One integer serves as the input. But the thing is, they are linked. If you send something to the output, the input will get it. Is that okay so far? Okay. Uh, pipe is like this. Pipe creates a file that looks like this. It's a conveyor belt that looks that seems to be circular. Okay. So this is a conveyor belt, <coughs> and, it, and the things go in one direction. Okay. So from the standpoint of the process, it has two points to access this particular conveyor belt. One, would, it will return two integers. Okay. So let's say you know 51 is the one that you use to send something out, and then 52 is the one that you use to receive something. So it seems like, okay, what is the whole point of doing this? This doesn't make sense at all. This is a conveyor belt. Um, whatever I send is something that I'm going to receive. Doesn't seem to make sense at all. What if you are to fork the process? Well, when you fork the process, when you have two processes, one thing that is shared between processes when you use the fork command are the file handle. So now you have two processes, both having access to you know, this same conveyor belt. The parent process can now say, okay, as a, as a parent process, I will only be concentrating on sending something onto this conveyor belt. The child process, on the other hand, can say, as a child process, I'm only interested in receiving something. So now you have just created a quote unquote file between two processes, where one process can write to it, and then the other process can read from it. And it becomes what we call a pipe, because it is a pipe so that it, it allows two processes to uh, communicate with each other, but it's a one-way communication. This is how the vertical bar symbol on the command line is implemented. Okay, So that's the pipe uh, system call. <coughs> and then we have the other, other ones. Times uh, set group ID, get group ID. Oh, it has a separate signal one, but signal is actually not sending signal. Okay, so this is yet another misnomer when we deal with uh, these particular you know, kind of uh, they're, they're trip, they're, they're, the names are inherited from when these things first came up. Kill should have been named signal or send signal. Signal should be named set up signal handle. <laughs> okay, so the signal system call allows you to specify hey, when somebody sent me this particular signal, which is a number, this subroutine is going to handle it. Okay, that's what signal is for. Okay, it's allowing you to set up a handler for a particular signal. Uh, we have, you know, I/O control. You know, this is actually pretty useful when you're dealing with low-level I/O input-output. We have Shuroot, which is a pretty good feature for security purposes because you can lock down a process to think a particular point in the file system is actually the root of the entire file system, and therefore, um, if the process misbehaves in any way, the worst it can do is to do damage from that point down in the file system and therefore protecting the rest of the file system from this particular child process. Okay. 
you're making a sandbox for a problem child, basically. So there's a whole bunch of stuff, you know, it goes on and on and on, and obviously today I'm not gonna go through all of these things. But you can see that, you know, whenever you want the operating system to do something, you go through int 80. Uh, okay, there's one single entry point, and you use EAX to specify what you want the operating system to do. Yep? If you were going to set up like an infinite loop and you kept calling interrupt, would that crack the system? Or would it just keep. An infinite loop to do what? Uh, just call interrupts. To call interrupts. Yeah, would it like crash the system because of so many uh, calls? <coughs> or would the system like. This uh, operating system, would it like put in like. A, it depends on what you're requesting. If you're requesting to read a, a byte, the system will let you do it. In other words, you can say, hey, uh, operating system, I want to read a byte. Give me that byte, okay? Now, when you're requesting to read, um, it's called a blocking call. So by default, it is blocking. And what it means is, if there is nothing available and the conveyor belt is not moving, your process is blocked, which means it is still active, it's not killed, it's just put into a suspended mode um, when a byte is actually available, the operating system will wake you up and you can continue execution at that time. Um, so it depends on what you're requesting. Um, if you are doing a fork in a tight loop, uh, there's a specific name for that particular type of operation. It's called a fork bomb. <laughs> because it is particularly bad because not only, not only are you uh, getting in a tight loop, which chews up processing resources, but you're also, also using up processes. For every iteration, you are spinning up two processes, right? So eventually, you, you use up all the available processes in the system, and the whole system will just hang up. So that's why it's called a fork bomb, because it does you know, uh, put your entire operating system out of commission. The good thing is most modern operating systems, including Linux, actually has a protection mechanism. So uh, I think there's a default setup of, you know, if you try to request more than X many forks, you know, over a certain limited amount of time, it would just basically say, nope, can't do it. <laughs> so the operating system would not let you um, execute fork uh, higher than a certain frequency. Okay, any other questions? Well, how do I look up how to use these names, right? Well, as it turns out, it's actually easier than you think. Okay, when you look up the name here, this is the name of the um, of the system call itself. But if you take out the sys underscore prefix, the remaining part of the name is actually the name of a C function. Okay, so exit is a C function, write is a C function, write uh, read is a C function, fork is a C function, open is a C function. Close is a C function. Great, they are C functions, but how do I learn how to use these you know, particular calls? Man, okay? But in this case, you know, man with, uh, you, you have to specify the chapter. So if I go man read, uh, well, in this case, it does get to it right away. But in some cases, there are multiple man entries or manual entries of the same name, and you might get into the wrong one. But this is it. Look at how many uh, parameters do we have? Exactly three parameters. When you look at you know, the number of registers that we have to set up for read, uh, for read or write, how many registers do we have to specify? We have to specify four, but that's including EAX. When you call and read, that is taking the place of specifying more, uh, three EAX. So the other three are really the three other registers. The first, op the first uh, parameter, FE, is EVX. The second one, buff, is ECX. And then the last one, count, is EDX. That is how you look up you know, how to make the system calls. If you're doing this in C and C++, you can just you know, pound include uh, UNI standard or UNIX standard, because this is universal to all UNIX type operating systems. But if you want to do this in assembly, now you know how to do it. You know exactly which register is Used is how it is used by the operating system. So kill is also a misnomer in C? Yes. <laughs> Let's Man, do it. Kill. 
man to kill. <laughs> <laughs> so this one reads funny, man to kill. Because if you look up kill, it might look up the command line kill, so it will tell you how to use it on command line. I'm not interested in that, I'm interested in how do I make a system call kill. So in this case, you know, register EAX, once again, is just a number to specify the kill operation. So PID is specified in EEX in this case, and uh, SIG, which is the, the signal that you're sending, is specified by ECX. <coughs> so if you specify EAX to be the number representing kill, EEX to represent the process that you're killing, and ECX to specify the signal uh, that you're sending to the other process, that will send you <coughs> If that other process, if PID is representing a process that you own, you can actually terminate a process. So you can write an assembly program to terminate you know, another process if that is you know, what you want to do. Is that okay so far? So we'll look up one more entry and then we'll you know, call it a day. Um, let's see. We'll look up link, okay? Because link or unlink, unlink is even better. Okay, unlink does not seem to be doing anything that's particularly useful. What am I in unlinking from, right? Um, let's go ahead to find. Let's go ahead and find out what it does. Okay, so we go to the command prompt, command to unlink. Unlink is to delete a name and possibly the file it refers to. In other words, it is RM. Then how come it doesn't just say it and say it is remove a file? Why does it say delete a name and possibly the file it refers to? Why is it possible? And you can also see you know, the parameter. Let's go through the parameter and the return type first. So when you look at the return type, it is an int. So that what that implies is after an int 8.0 in assembly, sometimes the operating system will try to tell you something and it is an integer value. So from what you already know about functions, how do you think that information is passed back to the process? Well, so EAX. No, it's, it's done through EAX. It's an integer, it's a scalar, it's done through EAX. So after int uh, zero, dollar, zero x, eight zero, EAX may have a particular value. And <coughs> the operating system try to tell you something. In this case, we only need one other register besides EAX, EBX. So in this case, EBX points to a null terminated path name, which is which the system will try to unlink um, from the file system. Yep. Uh, when you do return zero in main, that always uses EAX, not C. <coughs> so when you when you specify return zero in main, mm -hmm. that return value get passed back to the caller of main, which you do not see normally. Yeah. And that caller is going to take the return value of main, put it into the second, uh, put it into the parameter of exit, and then call exit. Okay, that's and done. that's why you know, the return value of main becomes the actual exit code of the entire process. Oh, I see. And that's passed from EAX. And in assembly, it is done by EAX, yes. Okay, but in C, you don't know. Well, in C, it is doing the same thing. It's just generating the corresponding code to specify that into EAX. Yeah, okay. Yep. Um, okay, but getting back to unlink here, why do you think unlink you know, says possibly delete the file it refers to? Well, once again, it is about you know, what we know. What do we think is a file? A file can have a couple different names, for one thing. A file can have different, not just names, it can be in different folders at the same time. You can have one single file that is concurrently in multiple folders. Yeah. <coughs> Sorry? I said, yeah, I was agreeing. Yep, but it, the mechanism that is done is not called a symlink. A symlink doesn't really do that. Symlink, a symlink is actually a file that is independent from the file that, that you're linking to. This is called a hard link. Um, in Linux, you know, a hard link is basically saying, okay, it is the same underlying blob of binary stuff, okay? But you can get to it from different places, potentially as different names. 
when the last one is removed, then the blob of binary stuff is also gone. It can be deallocated. Hard link is also possible in Windows NT, but it's not usually documented very well. And I believe home editions do not have the ability to do it. They, they lock down the command line so you cannot do it. But hard links are, are dangerous in many ways because you know, the, it, you're basically looking at exactly physically the same file. It's just that it is, you can refer to it by different names in different tabs. So potentially it can be very dangerous because people looking at the file system will think that they are different things, but they are actually the same thing. And, you know, and that's why it is usually not used you know, as a feature. Yep. I like that feature because I can have a several gigabyte uh, file list nested in different folders, yet only take the same amount, of, nearly the same amount of space. It's, it's good for organizing um, images, pictures, photographs. Because now you can, you, you can use one folder to organize by location, another folder to organize by people, and then another folder to organize by occasion. And they can all point to the same thing. So you can basically say, you know, Jack, you know, is in Yosemite on his birthday. And now you have three folders, three different ways to index the same picture, the same image file, you know, which is reciting, there's only one file, even though it looks like there are three files. But it is still kind of an awkward you know, thing because as far as backup is concerned, <laughs> because your, your, your backup software, like TAR, has to decide, do I want to back it up as three different files or do I want to preserve the fact that this is one single file? Because when you restore the TAR ball, the restoring file system may or may not support yeah. hard links. <laughs> if you try to un un untar this onto a um, FAT32 system, which does not have the concept of a hard link, <laughs> then you have a problem. Plus, it would have to when, if, when you extract it, you have to make sure it's on the same physical hard drive. Yep. Mm, not hundred percent sure about that one. I would think you could, because if all reason to back it is if your hard drive fails, you can back it up and put on a new one. That one I'm not so I know Symlinks you can uh, have on multiple physical hard drives. Symlink you can specify whether you want to follow the link or not when you tar. So you can recreate the actual Symlink with the same relative path to the original file. Because the, in the case of Symlink it's easier to deal with because there's only one actual file. The, all the other ones are shadow clones. <laughs> but in the, in the case of a hard link, there really is only one single file. There's only one single resource. It's just that you can locate it from different portals. It's just uh, from what I've seen, references can only be applied to the same yep. hard drive. Yep, exactly. So I'm not going to go through all of these things, you know, um, because you know many of these calls are way beyond the scope of assembly language programming. This is more like systems programming, which used to be uh, CISP 453. For those of you who are planning to transfer to uh, Sac State, you know you you can talk to Damon about you know resurrecting that class if you want that class. Back. What's that? Sac State? Hmm? What's it called? The Sac State Systems Programming, I think. Oh, okay. Yep. That's the only class at Sac State that make that uses C and C plus plus. What are they using? Other ones? Java. Oh, really? Yep. Which is which which makes this class really interesting because out of a one semester you know, long class. The first half of the class is about C. And then the second half actually talks about systems programming. Yeah. Because they don't know, they do, they do not use C for anything except for this class. That's fine. <laughs> All right, well, I think we are running out of time. You know, I'm hoping that you guys get a basic idea of you know, how a particular process can talk to the operating system and request the operating system to do something. All right, it is time. I'm going to move on to the lab. If you are doing your homework assignment, go to the lab so I can take a look at your program if you want me to take a look. Or not.